organizing this conference on studies of belonging. Tonight is the last night of our conference that included more than 40 panels, art presentations and keynotes. About tonight's program. After the keynote and some questions raised by me, we open up the discussion with you, our audience. Don't be shy and raise your question in the chat. I will make sure that your questions get to our speaker. But let me then introduce our speaker of tonight, Nadim Ruana. Nadim Ruana is Professor of International Affairs and Conflict Studies at the Fletcher School, Tufts University in the US. And he was a NIAS Fellow from September 2019 till June 2020. Prior to joining Fletcher, Dr. Ruana was the Henry Hart Rice Professor of Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University. He was a co-founder of the Program on International Conflict Analysis and Resolution at Harvard's Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Dr. Ruana is an affiliate faculty at the Harvard Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. He is also the founding director at the MADA Al Carmel Arab Center for Applied Social Research in Haifa. In addition to research and writing on conflict studies and international negotiation, Dr. Ruana's research includes work on the Israeli Palestinian conflict, Israeli and Palestinian societies, the dynamics of social conflict collective identity and democratic citizenship in multi-ethnic states, settler colonialism and questions of reconciliation and transitional justice. His most recent books include, I just mentioned us three, Israel and its Pal Palestinian citizens, ethnic privileges in the Jewish state, Cambridge University Press 2017, the second is The Palestinians in Israel, Readings in History, Politics and Society, Mada Al Carmel Publishers, 2015. And very recently he published, uh, he was one of the editors of the book Secularized Politics, just published by Cambridge University Press. Well, this is a way to introduce you, Professor Ruana. May I invite you to deliver your keynote? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ian Willem. I'm delighted to be back at NIAS, all, albeit uh, virtually. Congratulations on the 50th anniversary. I'm sure uh, <coughs> you will be happy. It, it's great that uh, I'm the last speaker because the conference will end and uh, uh, you will go back to your regular uh, things to do. I want to thank NIAS for organizing this timely and important conference and for giving me the opportunity to talk about the concept of homeland and its complexity in the conflict between Zionism and the Palestinians. Uh, my talk gains additional timeliness, not because I knew how to choose a topic, but because of the unfortunate circumstances of witnessing the fourth war on Gaza in just over a decade. Last month, we also witnessed confrontations between Israeli security forces and Palestinians in Jerusalem, all over Israel, and in the West Bank for reasons directly related to the topic of this talk, homeland, and to the same, same family concept of home, uh, uh, and to, to the concept of homeland and home. The world showed unprecedented solidarity with the Palestinians and their experience because of that. In my view, it was because the Israeli actions in Jerusalem were seen by many as naked acts of unhoming, this is the connection to home and homeland, uh, to unhoming Palestinian families in their in their places. It is the fact of depriving people of home in their own homeland that gained widespread and unprecedented international attention and sympathy. In this talk, I will 
discuss why the concept of homeland, next PowerPoint is fine, yes, uh, that's fine. Uh, the concept of homeland is important in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and try to show how, first, it helps interrogate important concepts such as citizenship. I'll show that uh, citizenship and right to belong are overtaken by the concept of homeland in non-Western context, in the context I'm talking about. It adds to our understanding of the conflict itself when we focus on homeland. And I think it provides, as I will argue briefly, new ways of thinking about dealing with the conflict. I will focus mainly on the first point. The talk uh, focuses on homeland, uh, the right to belong, and citizenship in the Jewish homeland because the idea of Jewish homeland in Palestine, its political manifestations and its practice on the ground provides a rich area for investigating the central theoretical question in this talk, interrogating the concepts of citizenship and the right to belong. Therefore, I will mainly discuss the status of the Palestinians who are citizens in Israel, because I'm focusing on citizenship. Those who, for complex circumstances, were not ethnically cleansed when Israel was established in 1948, and who were granted citizenship to, in the state of Israel for certain international circumstances. They, con they, they constitute about one-fifth of Israel's population. My working definition of homeland is as follows. Homeland in the nationalist imaginary refers to a defined territory claimed to be national home by a group, whether defined ethnically, culturally, politically, ling or linguistically, to which they feel a sense of affectionate belonging. I'll come back to that. It's very important over which they have a sense of ownership and in which they feel entitled to determine and defend their own dis destiny. Obviously, this definition applies to both Zionism and the Palestinian national movement, or in other words, to Zionists and Palestinians in considering the same territory that is Palestine as their home. Although this might tempt us to apply symmetrical analyses, yes, this is, you know, this is a, an Israeli-based and a Palestinian-based reference of affection to the same territory, which is the home, Palestine. So although this might tempt us to apply symmetrical analyses, such as detecting the conflict as one between two competing national movements claiming the same land, I claim that such analysis is simplistic. It's erroneous, it's misleading for understanding the conflict and misguided, even harmful, when thinking about ways to end the conflict. I will return to this point later. I examine four interrelated constituents or components of homeland, each of which poses questions about citizenship. I'll show how they pose questions about citizenship. The four components derived from the definition I just presented are ownership of the homeland. Who's the landlord of the homeland? Think about a state that has, or a place that has one, more than one ethnic group. Who is the homeland in that, in that, in that state? Is it shared? The right to belong and citizenship politics of belonging. Uh, who has the right to belong? Is the right of a belong challenged? Is it exclusive to one group? Identity and boundaries of effective bonds in the homeland. Who belongs to the effective we? Who, 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 how are bonds, effective bonds applied to which, pop, to which group? And then how do you find, how do you, who defends the homeland? And here I will focus on in non-legalistic -ling, in, in non lingo, uh, I will focus on constitutional wars for defending the exclusive belonging to homeland. So in this 
the state, the tool of nation building in this imagine, national imaginary becomes means for homemaking. You make the home by using the state as a tool, whereby it fun functions to organize the relationship between the land and the national owners to grant and protect the rights of the national group over the land and to promote the effective bonds that I talked about that characterize the particular relationship between the land and the group, particularly belonging and uh, loyalty. As the literature on nationalism shows, uh, this is, you know, by consensus, the process of national subjectivity construction, of national construction of identity, is symbiotic with the process of demar demarcating the excluded other. The, the, the demarcation is between who is in and who is out. And so the process of building national home is similarly underscored by continuously delineating the insider and pushing out the outsider, the excluded, the other from the home. The benchmark for inclusivity and exclusivity vary among different national groups, depending on the particular boundaries of membership postulated by the particular national ideology guiding the nation state. For example, think about civic nationalism that's defined by citizenship or ethnic nationalism defined by belonging to ethnicity or religious nationalism. Uh, or religiously based uh, states. So at the same time, the binary of citizen, non-citizen differentiation is only one example of boundaries. Introducing the concept of homeland, uh, by introducing the concept of homeland, different types and various degrees of otherness become embodied in the political notions of homeland and national home. These types of otherness, such as infiltrators, residents, natives, newcomers, olim, those who have the right to come to a particular country like Israel, immigrants, aliens, and, and so on. They become the subject of constant monitoring, status modification, and taking in or pushing out. Now, the concept of homeland helps understand how these types are constructed. For example, in the context of rising populist nationalism in Europe, in Western Europe, Europe Doivendak, our colleague here, argues that anti-immigrant and anti-refugee sentiments are framed through the notion of a lost home, repressing a longing for a, for a past of national homogeneity in the home. Dijvendak writes that in Western Europe, the crisis of home relates primarily to the changing composition of populations and the meaning attached to these developments by populist politicians. The raging debate around the interrogation of immigrants is increasingly framed in terms of who belongs here, thereby paralyzing natives and newcomers. End of quote from Dijvendak. This is very insightful and very important for understanding Western Europe, I think. However, in other contexts, this process is not necessarily identical or even similar. In the context of Zionism or the Jewish homeland with which this paper is concerned, these polar sides receive radically different meanings as the migrant settlers, that is the Jewish newcomers, are designated by the concept of a Jewish homeland as owners of the home, while the natives, the Palestinian Arabs, are designated as outsiders. In this sense, Zionism does not mirror populist nativist model modalities of European nationalism, but actually it reverses the native and the migrant. In order to highlight this total contrast and its implications, for understanding the relationship between the concepts of homeland and citizenship, I anchor the analysis of Zionism within a settler colonial paradigm, a paradigm that is being increasingly and, and acceleratingly, if one can say so, 
uh, uh, supported in the literature. Zionism as a, let, as, as a settler, colonial, as settler colonialism is, in my view, a simple scholarly based descriptive statement and not a value statement. If one puts aside the value laden part of how it is justified or what were the motivations of the, uh, of the founding fathers of the project or their global supporters, the project took the course of a settler colonial undertaking. For that matter, neither the justifications nor the motivations are, major, are of major concern to the native Palestinians whose continuous efforts to present what they considered as an unquestion, unquestionably settler colonial project have not been until recently well heard, particularly in Western political, cultural, and academic circle. A defining quality of the project of establishing a Jewish homeland in Palestine is that in its goal of establishing a constitutionally exclusive Jewish state, the concept and practice of replacement of the native is inherent. Zionism came to build Jewish homeland in Palestine, not to join Palestinians in a joint homeland. This is very important to understand. It is obvious that in practice, this could have been, this could have only meant displacement and replacement, a major characteristic of many settler colonial regimes. While displacement did not take the form of physical extermination as in other cases, nor was this one of the in, in intended means of achieving displacement, it did take the form of demographic elimination or demographic riddance by using violence as in various ways of ethnic cleansing of the vast majority of the Palestinians in the part of Palestine on which Israel was established or legal means such as citizenship laws that prevent Palestinian refugees or any Palestinian for that matter from ever returning while opening the gates obviously unconditionally to, to Jews uh, to emigrate. Displacement replacement also included geographic erasure. More than 400 Palestinian towns were destroyed inside the areas that became the state of Israel and replaced with hundreds of Jewish towns, many of which as I, I will um, mention soon are exclusively Jewish. It also included attempted cultural and historic erasure of Arab and Muslim presence and its replacement with Jewish history, employing and politicizing religious sites, archeological projects, the politics of museums and monuments building and so on. Like other settler colonial projects, the Zionist project em employed towards the native the psychological and epistemological justificatory degradation, dehumanization, disdain, racism, and establishing a system of colonial control with settler colonial privileges that's anchor, anchored in vast body of law. Uh, so these are not views really, these are, these are the facts on the ground. In the case of Zionism, therefore, the concepts of home and homeland become particularly problematized as Palestine, the land which Zionism described as the national home of the Jewish people, the Jewish homeland has long been the homeland of another national group. So you want to establish your homeland in a place that is the homeland of others. So Zionists did not emigrate to Palestine, as I mentioned, in order to become equal citizens in it, but in order to claim it exclusively as originally. Originally, that means thousands of years ago, theirs. Therefore, they using the term of returning to Palestine. This concept is inextricably tied to settler colonialism. The Jewish homeland is a settler colonial home. So what complicates things a bit further is that the project, or a lot further, is that the project of settler colonization has never stopped. It's ongoing all over the homeland. In Israel, 
it is openly called Judaization, but because of the unrefined ethnic overtone of the term, sometimes the term development is euphemistically used to refer to the same concept. So what are the components of, of, of constructing an exclusive homeland? And how does that problematize the concept of citizenship and pose challenges to the right to belong, including for citizens? Once the native Palestinians in Israel were granted citizenship in the Jewish homeland, could the homeland be expanded to become theirs too? Could they claim it as theirs? This question is fundamental in examining the limitations of citizenship beyond its narrow legal and instrumental sense. Citizenship has not provided the right to claim a homeland to these Palestinian citizens, the right to belong, the right to be equal, and the right to be of equal dignity. Obviously, I'm not using the term right in the legal or legalistic sense. Let's look briefly at the four constituents of homeland that I mentioned. The first one is ownership. Who owns it? Who has the keys? Creating the national space upon which a Jewish home can be established to acquire the accruing of Palestinian territory and its transfer to the ownership of Jewish nation or, uh, through national institutions in a process euphemistically called redeeming the land. The underlying imagination being that the land uninhabited by the Jewish people is a neglected space that needs to be cultivated and developed by its original owners, obviously with some religious overtones. Redeeming the land was achieved through various means. When Israel was established, I'm not going to go all over them, just to mention the essence of it. When Israel was established in 1948, uh, <clears throat> the Jewish colonies in Palestine owned about 7% of the country's land. Yes, I, I'd like to keep this, this, uh, this slide for a minute. 7% of the country's land, mostly purchased through the Jewish National Fund established in 1901. The Palestinians owned the rest of the country. Now, the Palestinian citizens own about 3% of the land. And the vast majority of the land, of the rest of the land, is owned by Israel's land authority and the Jewish National Fund through expropriation of land and homes owned by Palestinians uh, and, and through confiscating the total property, the total property of Palestinian refugees. Whatever they own is gone and they were banned from returning. So for our discussion, it's important to see how the concept of homeland is employed to sidestep citizenship in this case. Much of the states and the Jewish National Fund's land is designated for the exclusive use of Jews. Uh, uh, Arab citizens have no access to it or to reside in the hundreds of towns established in it. Uh, so here is how the foreign, the Israeli foreign ministry described the Jewish National Fund. I'm quoting. Of the institutions that turned land redemption from a biblical sounding slogan, slogan to a reality, one remains large and influential, the Jewish National Fund. It contains, it, it, I'm sorry, it continues to carry out its original mission, perpetuation of Jewish national ownership of land in the Jewish national home. I mean, listen to this perpetuation. Once the property is the property of these Jewish national foundations or institutions, as they are called, it's the property of the Jewish people. Nobody else can use them. Okay. Now, I, I want to refer to this, uh, to, 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 to this slide before I move to the next. This is a slide of that is timely these days. Actually, yesterday, this uh, march of flags by settlers and others 
tens of thousands into Jerusalem. This slide, these people are, are, are going to enter all Jerusalem, the city of all Jerusalem through the Muslim quarter with flags, chanting, chanting slogans that I can't repeat here, but if you want go to Google and Google to see what slogans are chanted by tens of thousands of people. This is showing ownership. This is showing who is the landlord. On the other side of the slide, you have people who want to show that they belong, that this is their place. And they can show that through prayer. And this should open our mind to why prayer and religious affiliation and so on is hitting roots. This is the way that they are showing that this place is theirs, hoping that in this place, when they pray, the Israeli security forces would, would not invade. Next, next slide, please. So this is the home, uh, the, who's the home owner and who is the guest. Next one. Right. So, so I said that much of that Jewish, uh, much of that land is owned by the state and the Jewish National Fund and Jewish institutions and Arabs have no access to it. This is, the, this is uh, 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 you know, hundreds of towns are built on this land. So there is a famous case that will just, just summarize the, the, <laughs> this issue to, to you. So let me, let, let me tell you about it. A famous case in which a Palestinian citizen and his family wanted to buy a house in a newly established Jewish town. He was rejected on the basis that, of what I just said, the land was leased by the state to the Jewish agency, which had the direct aim of Jewish settlement, which means not citizen settlement, Jewish settlement, okay? So it took, he went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court took many years to deal with the contradiction between exclusive national rights over the land and equal civil rights. So citizenship versus non-citizenship, right? The court ruled to allow the purchaser, but has not challenged the exclusive national ownership. This is best expressed through the following statement of the Supreme Court president in this photo, Aaron Barak, uh, at the time. Here's what Barak says. At the, at the other side of the photo is these Palestinian refugees who are holding the key too. You will see why I put the key uh, in this uh, photo after the quote. So Barak says, truth is a special key to enter the home is given to the Jewish people. And he refers the right of return 1950. However, since a person is duly within the home, duly within the home, he or she should enjoy equal rights like all other home dwellers. So the key to the place, the ownership of the place, those who own it are the Jewish people, not even Israeli Jews, incidentally. I don't want to go all over that. But so this is, uh, so exclusive homeland ownership overrides citizenship rights. Citizenship here gives some rights, but only in a homeland exclusively owned by others and whose keys are exclusively owned by others. How does this affect the whole issue of belonging, which is very important uh, as emerged in also in your conference? So the right to belong. Immigration and citizenship and naturalization policies give us a window for understanding a deeper layer of the politics of belonging and help answer the question, who has the legal right to belong and the moral right to belong to the, the citizenship, the legal right actually, to belong to the homeland in this case. Indeed, one marker perhaps the universally accepted marker of belonging to the homeland is citizenship. Thank you. This is right. I'm just reading from here. It defines on what basis this citizenship defines on what basis an individual rightfully belongs and is therefore included within those who belong on 
uh, who belong to a homeland and to whom the homeland belongs. Who is, who is included, who is excluded? Israel distinguishes, you can go to the next slide briefly. Israel di distinguishes, so actually this is the cover of my book uh, that Jan Willem mentioned 2017. <laughs> I don't want to go too much in it, but some people are in, some people are out. The blues are in, the colors, the others are pushed out. These are the colors of the Palestinian flag. So this is the boundaries uh, also of effective citizenship, as we will say. Uh, you can go back to uh, Israel distinguishes among different types of statuses emanating. No, I meant no need for slide now. Uh, among different types of, of statuses emanating from the concept of homeland of the Jewish people, resident, citizen, uh, of course, for those who are familiar, Ole, that's the term of ascending to the, to the land uh, uh, exclusively for Jewish people who want to, uh, um, to take advantage of the privilege of becoming automatic citizens and so on, illegal immigrants. But within the category, which is imp what's important to us here, talking about belonging, in particular with citizenship, is that within the category of citizenship, there are actually two types of citizenship in Israel, at least, but these are two major types. They seem to stem from the concept of homeland. This is why I'm, uh, I'm, I'm focusing on that. According to an Arab scholar and former parliamentarian, uh, Azmi Bshara, the two types of citizenship which are grounded in two entirely different sets of values are as follows. I'm quoting, one is incidental citizenship given to Arabs who happen to remain in Israel after the Nakba, that's after 1948 uh, expulsion. The others is essential citizenship given to Jews as Jews, end of quote. According to the right of return, people of Jewish descent from all over the world were given citizenship and not based on their birth in the land. Why is this important? Jews in the country were granted citizenship based on the law of return to indicate their essential belonging to the homeland regardless of where they are born, not because they were there when Israel was established. And mo most Palestinians who were given citizenship who happened to remain in the country and given citizenship after the 1948, were granted citizenship not by right of being there, but by right of naturalization. <laughs> they gained, it's, uh, it's remarkable. They gained the citizenship by fulfilling conditions of being at a particular place in a limited time, both determined by Israel, right? And this is how they uh, were given citizenship. And of course, this is how uh, this citizenship uh, was denied uh, others like refugees, Palestinian refugees and Palestinians who, for example, were studying overseas, let's say. Anyway, that's uh, too, uh, too detailed for, for this presentation. Obviously, these two types of citizenship are not equal, not even in the value attributed to them by the state. This granted citizenship has not stopped Israel, again, back to the value of citizenship, from applying towards its Palestinian citizens settler colonial policies, producing what they have elsewhere called settler colonial citizenship. Citizenship did not stop Israel from relentless attempts at erasure of culture, strict demographic control, constitutionally limiting political participation, such as you are not allowed to run for the Knesset in a party if the party denies that Israel is a Jewish state, right? So you have to not challenge that in order to have political participation. So again, it is belonging to the homeland that determines the most fundamental rights, even if the group holds citizenship. But beyond the right to belong, there is also the attractive side and the boundaries of belonging. 
And here I come to the affective side and boundaries of belonging. Uh, no, the one before that, actually, there is one about identity, but that, no, it's all right. We, we can keep it. I'll tell you when to put the other one. Thank you. So homeland, in the words of two Israeli colleagues, actually, uh, connotes a, quoting, set of culturally shared meanings that are formulated in patriotic terms. Homeland is evocative of many things, most prominently of an intimate sense of belonging and a powerful notion of loyalty. Importantly, homeland is located not only on maps and in, in minds of people, but also in culture, the realm of socially shared meanings where it exists as a dynamic set of specific home landscape. So it is that cultural and culturally shared meanings, affiliation with the land and the sense of bonding which the homeland evokes that provides the effective bonding of groups belonging to the same homeland. The familiarity with, its, with the history, names of places, all lead to intertwining the identity of the home, uh, uh, of, uh, 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 in the identity of the people and the identity of the place. The, uh, uh, the slide, please. Um, okay, in order for the home to become Jewish in this effective sense, for people arriving to it from all over the world, it had to be Judaized through a process that erased the markers of Palestinian identity and replaced them with markers of Jewish national identity. Nation homemaking, or in effect home overtaking here, becomes an ongoing process, still unfolding throughout the country today in the West Bank, Jerusalem, and inside Israel, in which the political and cultural and psychological all become uh, intertwined at the core of which process, the process at the core of which is the defining inevitable cleansing of the geography of the home, the geography of the homeland, not only from the physical presence of the native inhabitants, but from the symbolic markers of that historical process. So to make this exclusively bonding and effective, Belonging uh, uh, and to, to make this to make this exclusive bonding and effective belonging, a massive project was undertaken to changes the demographic, spatial, temporal, and cultural dimensions associated with the homeland, effectively constructing the exclusive national identity connected to the place as Jewish. Names of places, towns streets, valleys, geographic areas, and regions were all changed, Heb Hebrewized, and their Arabic origin erased to create the effective bonding. Demographically too, next one, next slide. Oh, in, in terms of bonding, I mean, look at this expression of effective bonding of two, a child, a Jewish child, affectionately treated by the Israeli police and an Arab an Arab child taken look how they are I mean this is this is also an expression of affection of uh, unchilding as my colleague uh, Nadira Shalhub Kevorkian uses the term and uh, unchilding and affection bonding next one uh, so demographically too in addition to the law of return the state employed the active emissaries in 150 locations worldwide to actively recruit citizens of other countries, of course, Jewish citizens of other countries, marking the boundaries of bonding. Here are the boundaries of, of bonding. They, the emissaries convince, uh, or, or without emissaries, they are convinced to make Aliyah, come to Israel, become immediate citizens, have privileges, given a package, and the Palestinians are pushed out. So these are the boundaries of effective bonds 
are at, 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 at its best. More recently, uh, Israel started homeland tourism in the form of massive, uh, in the form of massive global programs such as birthright and taglit to create effective bonds between global Jew Jewry and the land as a Jewish homeland and to promote the sense of belonging in an effort that has never been directed towards Palestinian citizens. It was not citizenship that determined the boundaries of effective belonging. Actually, it hardly affected the boundaries. It was the belonging to the homeland. The fourth one, I'll go over it quickly, and that is the power of who, who, whose nation and the constitutional, the constitutional homeland. So the, there are multiple constitutional laws that have been legislated by the state of Israel in order to reassert the exclusivity of this national recognition with multiple, multiple constitutional laws that explicitly reasserted the principle of the Jewishness of the state. And, uh, and the homeland. I will not inflict on you uh, legal and constitutional discourse. I will give you only one law and uh, perhaps close this point with it from 2018 about the Jewish homeland. It, it provides astounding example of the politics of and belonging. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. The basic law. Now, the uh, next one. Yes. So here is a constitutional law from 2018 in, in Israel. And in my mind, again, it's the homeland that's important in this, in this law of unbelonging, of, of uh, the basic law. It's called basic law Israel, the nation state. Uh, uh, the land of Israel is the historical homeland of the Jewish people in which the state of Israel was established. The state of Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people in which it realizes its natural, cultural, religious, and historical self-determination and the exercise of the right of national self-determination is in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people. So in, in I mean, in essence, uh, the Palestinians inside Israel are, are citizens, but, but this law tells the story of homeland, who owns it, who has the power, where's the uh, 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 bonding affections. And, and there are many other laws that are similar to this, but this is the most powerful. Jan William, if I have a minute, I'll, I'll talk about, about the value of homeland in thinking about the conflict. Two minutes. He can't hear me. So, so presenting Presenting discourse on homeland in this conflict helps support the theoretical argument about the limitations of citizenship. I hope I showed that. But the complete picture, of course, has to have the discussion on the Palestinian side. On the Palestinian side, uh, the encouraging sign is that in the, in the history of Palestinian, uh, no need for slide, uh, in the Palestinian uh, uh, political thinking, uh, there were experiments with a, uh, a common homeland for Palestinians and Israeli communities, Jewish communities, without Zionism, because Zionism uh, uh, is an ideology that seeks Jewish supremacy in Palestine. There are numerous groups now, Palestinians and Israelis, who are presently exploring these ideas and building upon them. My lecture should be seen as a contribution in this direction, because in order to go down that path, we have to recognize the malignancy of ethnically based exclusive states and exclusive homelands and propose visions that challenge the ethnically, uh, the ethnically exclusive right to belong. Uh, thinking in this direction of expanding the concept of homeland to include both Palestinians and Israeli Jews in a democratic system defined by full individual and group equality and by eliminating ethnic privileges is gathering support from younger generations. In my view, academic intellectual efforts, uh, academic and intellectual efforts, as well as political efforts, at least on the grassroots levels, should focus on how to open the space of homeland to be inclusive on both sides of the divide. 
this is not a project for governments yet and not for immediate uh, for the immediate future uh, only but in my mind this is the only project that can in the long run bring equality dignity and peace to all involved thank you very much I got and let me start with that and apologizing to you is that I actually pronounced your name not correctly that I should not say uh, Nadim Ruana ma Nadim Ruhana and I apologize but I didn't do that in the correct way anyway that was no, no, no. one of no, the many uh, comments that were already uh, sent to us and uh, what we will do is that I will ask you a couple of questions uh, 15 to 20 minutes and then we open it up to the public um, thanks for this insightful lecture. It shows clearly the very complicated relationship uh, between belonging and homeland. And uh, you show clearly uh, the problematic side when land, a country, soil is claimed in terms of homeland. But interestingly enough, at the end of your lecture, you also seem to think that actually we need the term homeland, but then in the sense of a shared homeland. So on the one hand, you, you, you show the problematic sides of homeland, but at the end you say, well, we shouldn't get rid of homeland, but what I would expect that you would propose, but you say, no, 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 we need homeland, but then a homeland both for the Jews and uh, for the Palestinians to live together. So I want to better understand this, but if you, if you agree with me, we first start with the problematic side of homeland, and then uh, we come later to the promises of a shared uh, homeland. If I start with the problematic side, I mean, the picture you give and all the data you give about what happened with the Palestinians um, speak for themselves. As you say, those are facts. Um, and you understand them in terms of settler colonialism. But in case it would be just settler colonialism, um, like, uh, I don't know whether everybody knows what settler colonialism is, but that's the form of colonialism where the settlers try to replace the original people. So it was like Columbus and the Europeans going to the, to, uh, to the Americas, and there the original people, the natives, were replaced by the settlers. So that is settler colonialism. <coughs> and the people the, who did that actually didn't claim, I think, that they had an historical right to, to the ground in the US. They did that because they felt morally uh, superior. I mean, in terms of, of, of race and so on, right? So the people who came there didn't respect uh, the Native Americans uh, as people who lived there. So that is a form of settler colonialism. But I think actually, if we want to understand why many people are not so critical as you are about what's happening in Israel, we have to understand <coughs> that in Israel, the Jews was not just about being settler colonial. They didn't arrive and say, oh, we are here, um, this is a new country for us. As you say as well, it is, no, we are here, but we return to the country, right? It is a return to Israel, to the promised land. So for the religious Jews, it is something about, there is an historical religious justification why they can come to that land. So it is a form of settler colonialism, but I think when it would have been just settler colonialism, that actually was not approved after the Second World War by other countries in the world. I mean, I, c I still come to speak about the role of the Holocaust, clearly, but first this point about settler colonialism. So I agree with you that what happened to the Palestinians, clearly, if you analyze it in a scholarly way, is the replacement of one population by another population, right? But it was not just a form of settler colonialism. It, in the perspective of the Jews, it was not going to a new land, it was coming back to the country that was always promised to them as the chosen people. So I think if you want to understand why actually quite some people did not protest against that form, you have to be specific about what form of colonial, uh, settlers colonialism is this. Does that make sense for you? That Because we have to understand why so few people share your 
analysis, or so few I cannot say, but you say, right, in the literature it's more and more. But I think it is good to be more specific as a scholar, more specific about the type of settler colonialism. That would be my first question. This is, this is a great question. Uh, let, me, let me try to answer it uh, in two ways. Uh, <coughs> first, I, I, you know, it's not up to you and me, uh, Ian Willem, to decide if we want to get rid of the concept of homeland. Homeland is there to stay. It's ingrained in people's um, feelings and bonding and identity and self-respect and history and continuity. What I would want to do is to point out to the malignancy of the concept of exclusive homeland. It doesn't, it, it, it can't work. It's conflictual. If you, if one of the two groups, Israelis or Palestinians, want to argue, if, if Zionists, to start with, wanted to argue that this is their homeland and their homeland only, whatever the justification, I'll come to that in a minute, it will, we will have conflict uh, uh, that, 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 how shall I put it? Their Palestinians are not going to give up their right to that okay, homeland. Okay, no, no, I understand that, but, but so, you know, go ahead. So, so, so the, it's the it's the it's the exclusivity. The same the same thing incidentally applies to the Palestinians. I think Palestinians have have to accept. I'm saying this because I I say that all over in Palestine, the right of the nation, the Jewish nation that was formed in Palestine, to belong there, not as Zionists, because mm -hmm. Zionism has superiority, and and privileges and so as equals, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we come now to the settler colonialism. The truth of the matter is that it doesn't, <laughs> I mean, again, I, I want to invite you to think from the point of view of the native, right? Mm -hmm. Does it matter to the native if God give, the, give this land to the, to, the, to, to the Jews? Well, it matters in that sense that the, the person that comes to occupy the land considers him or herself also as native. So what you actually show is that you have a competition between two groups and that both consider themselves, as you show, as natives. So therefore, I'm not sure whether for me the concept of settlers' uh, colonialism is so helpful because the people who came to the US, uh, the Europeans who came there, didn't consider themselves as natives to the country. That was not their claim. Whereas the Jews came as natives. How strange it may sound, right? The migrants considered themselves natives and that makes the conflict so very, very difficult, I think. Yes, it does, but it, it's even worse that people who are coming from overseas our, after 2,000 years, I mean, <laughs> to, to say we are natives. And incidentally, not all Jews say that. I mean, Zionism mm -hmm. was a minority even among religious Jews. Religious groups opposed Zionism. This is a group, the interest of which to take a homeland and establish sovereignty in that homeland coincided with the, of course, with their experience, horrible experience in Europe, yeah. and with the interest of, of, uh, uh, of imperialist forces, yeah. so right? it, okay. and, and all of that. So to call themselves yeah. natives is, I, you know, we have also to be critical, I think, if somebody comes to me after 2000 years, I would say, listen, you have, you have connection to this land. I respect that connection. I think Christians have connection to the land. Now, if Jews have more connection than Christians, that's fine. So come and practice your connection as equal with the natives. No, no, no. Now, the fact okay. of the matter, and I'll end with this, yeah. young yeah. man. The fact of the matter is that the course, the course of the settler, of what the process of taking over the land mm. is a settler colonial course. Now, okay. that's the... Okay. Um, as you say yourself, indeed, I, I, th I think, historically speaking, that uh, as far as people understood what was happening and didn't block um, the, um, the cleansing of Palestine from Palestinians, right? That is, perhaps for some religious people, indeed, it was because the Jews has had a kind of religious 
uh, justification for that. But that I agree with you. That probably that was only a minority of people who who agreed with that. I think, as you already hinted at, that the main reason why people respect or support the fact that the state of Israel is the home of Jews, obviously, is clearly re mostly related to the terrible, terrible fate of the Jews during the Second World War in the Holocaust. And um, don't you think that the very fact that the Holocaust happens, that that actually is the main explanation why this, this claim in terms of a homeland, but what, what, as you have shown, right, is extremely exclusionary to, towards everybody else who is not part of the people of the homeland, the, 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 the self-assumed people, how do you say that? Um, don't you think that actually the Holocaust is the main explanation why the world, if I may say so, in the public eye, people have said, well, Jews have to be safe. There should be a place where Jews are safe. Uh, they have to survive. They have suffered so much. And of course, that is uh, we don't have a, a normative discussion here, so that's not for a moment a justification for what happened to the Palestinians. But to better understand why this claim to a homeland was actually granted to the Jews, that I think is really almost totally can be understood because of the Holocaust. Uh, <coughs> now... <laughs> Now, uh, I think the Holocaust was the culmination of what Europeans did to Jews. It's sure, not, sure. No, 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 so no. Sure. No, I, I, know, I, know, I know we agree on that. And, you know, the, the Jewish experience in Europe is, uh, I mean, they need a safe place. I, I think Europe, their homeland, that their way should provide them with the uh, home place, uh, with the safe place. Now, now if, if, the, if the world wants a safe home for Jews, I have no objection to that. And, uh, you know, uh, so, but <laughs> how shall I put, put it, Jan Willem? But to have that safe place for the Jews in my homeland exclusively, you are asking too much. I think that what Palestinians could have done after the Holocaust, if not for the Zionism, and Palestinians, incidentally, did have that, that tradition, you know, after yeah. the Armenian genocide, yeah. Armenians came came to the yeah. many came to the yeah. Middle East and are some of the you know they became they became ingrained in the societies of the Middle yeah. East. Right, yeah. the Middle East after 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 the expulsion of, of Spain, right, Jews went to various parts of the Arab world, the Muslim world, and, yeah. and so on. So 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 Palestine, Palestine because of that connection could become hospitable place. But to come and take it over no, no, uh, uh, exclusively yeah, is... You, you, that, that's a clear point. Uh, but indeed, it is better yeah. to understand why the world did not protest more because the world felt so terribly guilty, right? So but it, the world that, felt so course, terribly guilty. And, yeah. and of course, that the, the Palestinians then paid a, a terrible price for that. Perhaps I can make a comparison. I, it's always risky, but I want to, as a scholar, I want to better understand these mechanisms, right? That a group that was ter terribly treated, the Jews, then become themselves people who, to put it mildly, discriminated the Palestinians, right? And I don't know whether you had the opportunity to watch yesterday's keynote speaker, Amin Gaziani, but he nicely shows, and it is a bit a risky parallel, but I think there are the same mechanisms, that uh, lesbians and gays, LGBTQ uh, people, queer people, um, also want to have, wanted to have, want to have their own spaces, not only their own neighborhoods, but there have been quite some organizations in the history of gay and lesbian liberation that are not coincidentally uh, named like lesbian nation, gay nation, queer nation. And Gaziani pointed out that in the case of queer neighborhoods, the same mechanisms developed us everywhere where groups claim territorial exclusivity, right? So for instance, in the Castro in San Francisco, where gays and lesbians live together, they don't want straight people to buy houses. They don't want Starbucks uh, to come there because they want a community owned uh, coffee brewery. Uh, and it sounds like perhaps small examples, but 
Gazzani, Gazzani made actually the same point that in order to have your own space, if you really want to have your own space among your own people, discriminated groups seem also to start to discriminate themselves, right? To make distinctions between with whom do I want to live and with whom I cannot live. So that raises many puzzling questions, right? Um, what does that mean for the possibility of living together of various groups, as you uh, uh, argue for, within the same territory? Should we not get totally rid of the idea that we can claim some places really as ours, right? Is the notion, and that of course is the basic question I want to raise to you, is the notion of homeland not always divisive as of and exclusionary? Because you show so clearly in the case of Israel that the notion of homeland has uh, very, very negative effects for the Palestinians. So that brings me to the second half of your uh, discourse, in which you say, well, but actually we need the notion of homeland. Homeland also has a promise, because of course, right, you are clear about the fact that you want equal citizenship for everybody living in Israel, right? Also for uh, the uh, native Palesti Palestinians who live in Israel. Equal citizenship. Um, a neutral state. I guess you are in favor of a neutral state there. But you say equal citizenship and a neutral state is not enough because people also want to be respected and recognized in their longing to belong. So Palestinians should respect Israelis, Jews, as um, people who belong, and Israelis should respect Palestinians, that they belong. So you say citizenship is really about affect and about emotions, and whereas I would say, well, we better become less emotional and let's get rid of these ideas <laughs> of a homeland because it only creates, has terrible consequences. You show the terrible consequences and then you say, oh yeah, homeland is a solution. So, so please help me out. <laughs> this is great. Again, I say that exclusive homeland is the problem, not homeland. Here, I'll give you an example that refers. I, I, I'm sorry I missed uh, the keynote yesterday. No, it's okay. Uh, yeah. It was too, too, early, too early for me. Uh, I'm, as you know, I'm on, uh, yeah. on a different zone, time zone. So, uh, but, you know, people, people I mean, we, uh, this is, uh, we know that people want their own spaces. They want to, the, the sense of we, the differentiation, people want to be we and want to be different at the same time. And this is great. I, I'll give you an example that many of us are familiar with, the old city of Jerusalem. The old city of Jerusalem has four quarters. It has a Muslim quarter, Armenian quarter, Christian quarter, Jewish quarter. They claim the city as their own. That's their city, that's their homeland, it's for everybody. Many Arab communities did have, uh, you know, if you go to small towns, you know, you have Christians living separately from Muslims, let's say, but they are the same community. So the, 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 I think that the, the, the missing link in the analysis of what you mentioned about the lesb lesbian nation and so on, is that, of course, they are welcome to do that, but I don't think they are thinking about claiming sovereignty mm -hmm. or exclusivity or the power of the homeland or marching with their flags to, to, uh, to, to assert and so on and mm -hmm. so on. So the issue is, is not the difference, Jan Willem. The difference actually should be appreciated and is appreciated. And I think, I think that there are many, many places where this difference is, uh, is it's the exclusivity of that. And yeah, if, if, I may, that. if I may interrupt you, I think uh, we agree on that, in, not in the sense of a normative sense, but analytically, right. the problem is the biggest when people claim exclusive homeland on the national level. I mean, we right. do, of course, see Jewish, gay and lesbian, Chinese, etc. neighborhoods, but you're totally right, they are far more permeable and there is not a question of uh, state sovereignty involved, right? So, it, but, it, but it is about that you claim a space for your own group, and that, as you say, right, seems to be that happens among many people, 
And that perhaps is an argument in favor of you, that you say, well, we have to acknowledge that people need those emotional investments in certain places and spaces as theirs. But then you, su you suggest it is possible at the level of the country as such to share the country, to share the homeland. And we, c right. we, get, we get quite some reactions by uh, people who are watching who seem to think that you are not, and yeah, that given what also happened now recently, right? Um, the violence and the unequal violence, um, that it is not very realistic that Israeli nor Palestinians are ready at this moment to live together and to acknowledge that both have a right to experience Israel as their homeland. So it's not a question about how re realistic you are because that is that's always the wrong question, but it is the question about where, on what do you base your hope? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, you are right. Uh, so so I, I, I don't think that people, I'm not calling for people to have the right to belong to Israel. I have, I'm saying that and I, I just want to mention your earlier point about the neutrality of the state. Yeah. The neutrality of the state uh, will never happen if, if one group thinks this is the homeland of one group. So the neutrality, this is why I'm starting with homeland, and it ties up to your second question. I think that the area itself is the homeland. It is actually the way it is. It's the homeland of two groups, of mm -hmm. the Palestinians, where if it's, un I mean, let me, uh, I, I'm going to make a normative statement here. That is, that cannot be uprooted. You know, the recent events showed that the Palestinian citizens of Israel, that the law I mentioned told them, this is not your place, this is not your homeland, this is not your state. They just went out. They don't listen to laws. This is what people do. This is our homeland and this is our state. So the question, I think, I, I, in the last sentence, Jan William, I mentioned it's not a project for governments. It's not a project for tomorrow, for, for tomorrow only. It's a long-term project. We have to start laying the foundations. I know it's hard to imagine. But at the same time, I tell you that many Israelis and many Palestinians live together. If you take out the issue of uh, power over and of exclusivity, they have enormous closeness and bonding. I think that these people can live together equally. And I, I believe that, that, yes, I understand that people ask about where one gets the hope. The young generation gets the hope. They have the hope. Many groups started doing that. Israelis and Palestinians together thinking about a future of equality in one homeland. The political mechanisms of that are for the future to be uh, uh, figured out. But I think the idea, I, I, would, I would pose to anybody who's asking that question, is that idea more realistic than one group controlling another group forever, whether it's Israelis or Palestinians or not. Yeah, yeah. And is this something that I think we can recruit humanity to, uh, 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 to, to, to work with? And obviously it needs development. Right. Obviously it right. needs to work with. Yeah. It, um, we get many questions uh, in which people try to compare situations. So they ask if you think about other countries where groups were living together heavily divided uh, and fighting each other, what are the moments and mechanisms by which they overcame their divisions? Uh, some people suggest compare Northern Ireland and the Netherlands, for instance, and look at how Protestants and Roman Catholics lived together or lived together and that in Northern Ireland it became uh, a civil war and the situation is still very tense and people still define themselves very much in terms of antagonistic terms of being Roman Catholic, of being Protestant, right? And they seem also to have some problems to share the 
the territory, even though there have been hopeful developments. In the Netherlands, I mean, I read the Dutch history as particularly the start of the 20th century as a moment that we barely avoided to have a civil war among Roman Catholics and Protestants, right? So we had the pacification in which we said, well, okay, we have to live together. We are all minorities and we just lock ourselves up in all kinds of social pillars and we just don't deal with each other, right? It was not so much territorial separation, but people lived their lives within their own pillars and they really didn't meet people of a different religion. And interestingly enough there, this was solved not because Roman Catholics and Protestants start to love each other and start to say, well, but you are also a nice guy. Not at all. It was overcome because religion itself became far less important. It was because people were not so Protestant anymore and not so uh, Roman Catholic anymore. And I don't want to compare too easily, but it isn't it the same would be helpful in the case of Israel and the Palestinians, right? So people seem now so much defined by one identity that is opposed to each other instead of that they have various identities and sometimes they share things and sometimes they don't share things. So the very fact that both countries are deeply religious and sometimes even the state or yeah, parts of the state are defined by religion, if I can frame it in that way, that perhaps also makes it very, very uh, troubling. You just published a book on secularization, so I'm curious to see, do, don't you think that that would be extremely helpful? What would be extremely helpful? Well, yeah. if, 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 if uh, perhaps I should frame it more as a question. So what could help to make your very optimistic, actually, hopeful strategy for our watchers even more, the people who watch even more convincing, uh, instead of, as you say, well, young people seem to live that new reality. How is it possible that the young people live that new reality? Are they less defined, for instance, by their religion? Is that for them a smaller part? Do they have other identities that they share together, for instance? So can you, can you tell more about the sociological mechanisms by which people overcome their huge uh, antagonism? Right. Sorry for the big question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... Uh, Listen, there are many, many questions within the same question, very rich, but, uh, you know, Muslims and Jews uh, did not have a history of uh, religious uh, antagonism uh, in, uh, let's say, uh, after you know, uh, di in, in, the, in the either the modern history or uh, and Christian, I mean, I mean, in in the Arab world, that did not happen. As you know, there's no particular animosity, and there's no no reason why Muslims, Christians, and Jews can have their religious affiliation. The thing is that when you have, and that ties with uh, with the book you mentioned with with religious nationalism, when when the nationalism is confounded. With, uh, uh, with with r with religion, and I think I think unfortunately, what's happening in Israel is unless the world, I, I think Israel needs help, frankly, and 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 the world by not criticizing Israel and putting Israel aside and being afraid of being accused of anti-Semitism, is letting Israel go on a path that is unimaginable because because the the justification of superiority and what is happening and the extreme nationalism is increasingly being justified by religion and in our book we talked about that as as very dangerous when the state itself goes that path not groups the state in india and william as you know in sri lanka and in Israel, and in other, some other places, in Serbia, in the, the nationalist claims of the state, not of groups, are made in the Hindutva, for example, in the name of religion. And the homeland is being claimed exclusively for one group in a similar yeah. Yeah. process. That's very, that's, I think we have, 
we have to be we have to be aware of that. What what makes people change? Let's take South Africa. The world makes people change. The world doesn't accept it anymore. Mm -hmm. The world says it's not acceptable. We have many many. We have an Israeli, the leading. I, I mean, this is not new to many of your people. The leading Israeli human rights uh, organization calls Israel apartheid. Mm -hmm. Human Rights Watch calls Israel apartheid. When the, I think the world has a role to play. If the world closes its ears and eyes because it's fear, it, because because of the guilt that, uh, that we mentioned earlier, or whatever reason, it's not helpful. Not even to Israel, I, I would say. Okay. And you know, then, so then, I think. So I think the world has a, a place to to and 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 in in the Netherlands, yes, I mean there, there we have to look for uh, and a super a super what's the term an identity that 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 brings both both groups together. And I think in in Palestine it could be the homeland. It's our homeland. Yeah. We have affection to it. We have affinity to it. Yeah. I don't deny yours. You don't deny mine. Let's start there. Okay, this is, uh, I think, an extremely important moment in this conversation because I think for many people, like um, th as was my experience when I read your presentation in advance, uh, is that on the one hand, I think many people expected that you would say, well, given what the notion of the homeland does, the exclusive homeland, uh, that is a bad uh, thing. But at the same time, it's interesting that the very same notion in a different interpretation, and that's what this conference is about, right? About belonging and homeland. You see uh, a productive possibility. Let me move to a couple of questions. You already related to that implicitly, that will the situation change in Israel? Then it is necessary to develop uh, critical voices all over the world. Uh, and many people raise questions, and uh, perhaps I should mention names, otherwise it doesn't look as if we honor the people who raise uh, questions. Uh, but for instance, um, Sedef Oske asked, regarding the actual and implied sanctions to the academic academics that voice their concern about and question the Israeli position against Palestine in the US academic realm, I would like to know Professor Ruana's reflections on the university as an institution conceived to be a safe space for critical thinking and his experience in the academic world, the difficulties or probable sanctions he might face or have faced. So this is also an invitation to say more about your own positionality there. And there are quite some other questions that are very related that I'm not going to read, but all about this, that those who do uh, ask attention for what's happening in Israel and also more recently um, are confronted uh, with sometimes singled out or confronted with sanctions within their universities. So perhaps you can speak about that. <laughs> I'll be happy to speak about that. <laughs> Listen, I don't want to uh, talk too much about my own personal, uh, but I, okay. I appreciate the question. Yeah. I can only say that I paid ha happy, uh, ha heavy, heavy price. And I can tell you, I can tell you with, with, almost certainty that I don't know Palestinians who speak about these things who did not who have not paid price in in this in this country or non-Palestinians. So let me start by a recent incident, a recent incident, and then answer the question of uh, so University of Toronto hired a professor of human rights. From I think she she was based in in England. She wrote about Palestine and Israel and so on, and she was uh, offered the, the 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 committee approved her. It was uh, reversed under the pressure because one donor said the Jewish community. I'm 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 telling you it's something that was published in the New Yorker. Mm -hmm. It's nothing nothing to it's it's all out. Now, so the offer was reversed. But I'll tell you something that never happened almost before, that the, the faculty of the University of Toronto and the faculty in Canadian universities and the faculty in Northern American universities went up in arms against something like that to happen. This is not the first time. This is not the whatever time. But this is almost the first time I know of 
that there is this kind of reaction. I think the space is opening. Mm -hmm. I think the Palestinian narrative is given more legitimacy. I'll tell you about something else. Israeli Studies Association, one of the conservative pro-Israel historically and so on, but also with critical, uh, did have a statement criticizing how Israel behaved and, and respecting the rights of people who want to do BDS in academia. I'm not saying that American academia changed completely, but I can tell you that it's changing particularly among the young generation. And this is simply because the young generation got out of the hand of the hegemonic forces, including you know, the media and, and so on. They have their own sources, they communicate, they learn, they travel and so on. So things are changing. And I think the you know, American academia, as you know, Jan Willem, I was a professor at Tel Aviv University and I was a professor for a long time, most of my life. I mean, at Tel Aviv University was it for a short while, four or five years. I can tell you that speaking about Palestine and the issues I'm talking about here is easier in Israeli university than American university. Mm -hmm. And this is something. This is changing, and I hope that more changes will happen with the new generation. I see that <clears throat> in the changing discourse, in the media, in the political, in the political forces, as you know, I don't know how much people know, but you know, the young generation in the Democratic Party, 26 or 28 senators sent, Democratic senators sent letters to Biden during the war to stop the war, right? This is unheard of. This yeah. is unprecedented. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's related to our topic today and to your conference, because people felt that the home is being is being taken from its its legitimate owners. So, uh, so I think yeah. I mean in short that uh, things are changing, and uh, as to BDS, I think it will gain support in the following sense: can that be, people can, can people be, people will say, like me, people have the right to do BDS or not to do BDS. Right. Sorry, not I didn't want to interrupt you, but it is uh, we are getting to a closure. And I thought that uh, perhaps it's good to once more refer to the many reactions and we will save the reactions for you. Um, some had a very substantial char character and I raised most of those questions, but clearly people also agree or disagree about um, whether the conversation we have and the presentation you gave, whether, th whether, that was, uh, whether this is a scholarly event or far, mo far too much politicized, uh, and particularly those who disagree with your analysis say it's just political. Um, I think um, it's, it's always important, and also uh, for NIAS and as a director of NIAS, to think about what kind of questions do we research as scholars, right? So what can be the contribution of scholars um, and, well, hopefully also with a positive impact on the most pressing pressing problems of our time. Um, and I do think that your contribution tonight shows how important it is to do exactly what you do, to do analytical, conceptual clarification, because that helps us better understand why certain things passed as they did, without much protest from the rest of the world, right? Uh, and at the same time that you show that even if a certain concept like homeland is used in a certain way in a specific context, that it doesn't mean that such a concept does not have a potential and with a different interpretation uh, in a new period. So to frame it in another way, I think myself indeed that we, didn't, we shouldn't shy away for this kind of analysis. On the contrary, that it is exactly the task of scholarly institutions to give uh, space. There was one uh, voice at the public, and it sounds perhaps a little bit self-congratulatory, but let me cite it. Uh, somebody wrote, I would like to thank NIAS for providing a space for an academic discussion of such an overlooked and sometimes intentionally repressed topic, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the context of uh, belonging. And that's exactly what I think our aim was tonight to do, right? To think through uh, which concepts are used in which ways, 
sometimes with the most terrible consequences for people on the ground, right? Um, and that is different from a purely political uh, discussion. And I think um, for you this is not new, because I think <laughs> often when you say, say something, people will reproach you that it is a political statement. But I think it is, it is important to have that discussion, because it tells us a lot about how we perceive uh, science and how uh, we perceive institutions uh, like NIAS. Your final words on that, uh, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's it's really remarkable that I, I think you put it very well. I mean, this is not the first time. Uh, this is something that people like me face often, that this is political. <laughs> it, I think it's a way of... Uh, I, it serves many purposes to call it so, but I think it's also, for me, it's avoiding the issues for people who frame that. I think... The, the courage requires that. Tell me what is not, <laughs> what was inaccurate, what was political. It, to say the whole thing is political because I'm, call, I'm saying, I'm showing that I, you know, what I did, I'll, I'll end. I'm not, I, I'm not going to be windy and, and long, but I took the concept of homeland. I defined what are the components of homeland? I try to apply it to the Jewish state and show how the Jewish state uses all these components are exclusive. And that is, frankly, conflict provoking. I think a similar work should be done about the Palestinians. And I'm doing that. I mean, as you know, Jan Willem, I'm, I'm in the, you know, I, I mean, my project is on both sides. I'm more advanced on the Zionist side, but I think it should be done on the other side, and I think that is... Uh, <laughs> of course, it has a political dimension to it, and this is what we should be doing openly, frankly, courageously, and critically. I, I'll end with that. Thanks uh, so much. Uh, thanks for your lecture. Thanks for this very frank conversation. Um, this was the third keynote, uh, as I already mentioned. Uh, Amin Ghaziani uh, spoke yesterday, and Gloria Wecker uh, had the opening keynote. All three keynotes uh, can be watched uh, on the NIAS YouTube uh, channel. Uh, it takes a while to also upload uh, the last uh, tonight's keynote. And moreover, also the opening ceremony and the closing ceremony ceremony will be uh, online soon. So for those of you who missed it, uh, there's an opportunity to watch uh, back. And that is open to everybody. So for the people who participated in the conference, for them uh, it's also possible uh, to ask for the recordings of uh, the sessions, because what we aim to do is to collectively work on an agenda for the future research on uh, belonging. So this is the end of the conference. And I have to be, I'm extremely grateful to, to many people. Well, most and most important, of course, to all participants. We had so many people, we were happily surprised how many people did participate, uh, who presented, but also the many visitors, our partners. Uh, and let me also thank and use this moment to thank um, the people who made this event possible. So all NIAS staff and the help desk, but also the KNW, the Royal Netherlands Academy for Arts and Sciences, Maxim Business Events, Melissa, Smits Light and Sound, Dan, Wouter and their team, Graphics, Patrick Engels, the newspaper, already three has seen the light and there will come a fourth in a week, Sharon Ubani, uh, all of them, thank you so much, and I, I really feel sorry that I don't have the opportunity to mention all your uh, names. As I said, this was the start of, I hope, a long journey in which we map all the possible meanings of belonging. Belonging, home, and homeland. Uh, I actually think that we know now a lot about homeland. So when we will meet again in two years, because NIAS will organize a conference on belonging every other year, 
Um, let's see what are the other urgent conceptual scholarly clarifications that are needed and that speak to the pressing problems of our times. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Nadine, for Thank once you. more for your presentation uh, and the discussion uh, we had. And then I'm afraid I have to say this is the end. Thanks to all.